Welcome back to my channel all. Throughout this episode I am going to share some of my research which contributes towards the possibility that genetic variations and mutations associated with disabilities are the next stage in evolution. In other words, neurodiversity. First of all, it's been discovered that there is no autism gene, no ADHD gene, no schizophrenic genes, etc. And that these genes are in both non-disabled and disabled people. Science writer Matt Ridley points out, I quote, The Human Genome Project is founded upon a fallacy. There is no such thing as the human genome. Neither in space nor in time can such a definite object be defined. At hundreds of different loci, scattered throughout the 23 chromosomes, there are genes that differ from person to person. Nobody can say that blood group A is normal, and OB and AB are abnormal. So when the Human Genome Project publishes the sequence of the typical human being, what will it publish for the ABO gene on chromosome 9? The project's declared aim is to publish the average, or consensus sequence, of 200 different people. But this would miss the, the point in the case of the ABO gene. Because it is a crucial part of its function, that it should not be the same in everybody. Variation is an inherent and integral part of the human, or indeed any genome. End of quote. Mutagenesis has traditionally been viewed as an unavoidable consequence of imperfections in the process of DNA replication and repair. But if diversity is essential to survival, and if mutagenesis is required to generate such diversity, perhaps mutagenesis has been positively selected for throughout evolution. T. H. Morgan says, the discovery that the same mutation happens repeatedly, not only within the same species, but in different species, is one of the most interesting discoveries in recent genetic work. It means that certain kinds of changes in the germ material are more likely to occur than our others. The appearance of new variations in the hereditary material is something less of a random process than we had it there to supposed. End of quote. In Africa, researchers found sickle-shaped red blood cells in people across a broad belt, from Nigeria in West Africa to Tanzania in the east. The cells also turned up at high rates in people in parts of the Near East and India, and in southern European countries such as Greece. Genetically speaking, this made no sense, because inheriting two copies of the gene is so deadly. The mutation should have become rarer with passing generations, not more common. In 1952, a South African born geneticist named Anthony C. Allison observed that people in Uganda who carried a copy of the sickle cell mutation suffered fewer malaria infections than people with normal hemoglobin. Later, research confirmed Dr. Allison's finding. The sickle cell mutation seemed to defend against malaria by starving the single-celled parasite that causes the disease. The parasite feeds on hemoglobin, and so it's possible that it can't grow on the sickle cell version of the molecule. Sickle cells are a rare example of human evolution, where we have a good idea of what happened and why. I'm just going to quote from a book called The Power of Neurodiversity, by PhD Thomas Armstrong. I quote, It was believed to be a mutation that caused large segments of the European population to survive the bubonic plague in the 14th century, and that continues to resist infections like HIV and smallpox in today's world. Mutations can also build on one another and create new metabolic pathways for the organism. As we've seen in chapter 8, it may be mutations that created significant changes to the brain a hundred thousand years ago that led to new forms of thinking and culture. This suggests that we should always be on the lookout for aberrant behaviour as possibly beneficial to the species. And as noted throughout this book, 
we have to counteract our natural tendency to see human nature of our current cultural myopia. Since values change, and as they change what we view as good in human functioning may turn out to be bad, and what we view as bad may turn out to be good. End of quote. If we pay attention to Thomas Armstrong mentioning mutations building on one another, creating new metabolic pathways for a minute. A metabolic pathway can be defined as a set of actions or interactions between genes and their products that results in the formation or change of some component of the system essential for the correct functioning of a biological system. And as Thomas Armstrong pointed out, what we see as good functioning today we may see as bad in the future. We must remember we are interconnected and interrelated with the environment. We are not separated from it. So as the environment evolves, we are going to have to evolve with it. These mutations are possibly producing the required metabolic pathways to enable us to survive in what our environment is going to become. Geneticist J.B.S. Holden said in 1932 that people with predispositions were enabled to survive an alien environment with foreign germs and new living requirements. They may not have been the strongest in the previous environment, but were stronger in the new environment. Evelyn Fox Keller says, I quote, We now know that mechanisms for ensuring genetic stability are a product of evolution. Yet, a surprising number of mutations in which at least some of these mechanisms are disabled have been found in bacteria living under natural conditions. Why do these mutants persist? Is it possible that they provide some selective advantage to the population as a whole? Might the persistence of some mutated genes in a population enhance the adaptability of that population? Apparently so. New mathematical models of bacterial populations in variable environments confirm that, under such conditions, Selection favours the fixation of some mutator alleles, and furthermore, that their presence accelerates the pace of evolution. End of quote. Notice how Evelyn Fox Keller mentions populations in variable environments under certain conditions. The diagnosis rates of disabilities, said to be primarily genetic, seem to vary between each country. And every country is a population in a variable environment. If we think of a sickle cell mutation, the mutation is more dominant in environments where malaria is endemic. So in this case, if an area is under the condition of malaria being endemic, selection favours the fixation of the sickle cell mutation. So can't we assume that selection favours the fixation of genes associated with all other disabilities and are more dominant in countries under certain conditions which can explain the variation of diagnosis rates between countries. I'm just going to qu quote from a book by someone called Dr. Gaber Mate, a physician. If you just give me a moment to find the page. I quote, The great traumatologist Dr. Bessel van der Kolk has noted that our culture teaches us to focus on our personal uniqueness, but at a deeper level we barely exist as individual organisms. This will certainly be news to the average ego. The word ego, as I use it here, refers not to the traits of arrogance or conceit in certain egotistical people but to be internally perceived separate self, with which we each identify, the me, myself and I, we mean when we use these personal pronouns, as we do hundreds of times a day. Even a healthy ego is convinced of its separateness, an entirely reasonable perception, the capacity to experience individual selfhood in all its facets is part and parcel of being human. Our difficulties begin when we lose sight of the other side of the equation, which is just as real 
if less apparent. The interrelatedness of seemingly isolated organisms has now been discovered even in the lives of trees that form living networks, communicating through electrical impulses akin to animal and human nervous systems, hormones, chemical signals and scents. As an article in Smithsonian Magazine reports, trees of the same species are communal and will often form alliances with trees of other species. Peter Wall Halben, a German forester who has become well known for popularising such information, wittily calls it the wood wide web. That our own individual minds and bodies are intimately linked is fairly simple to grasp. Less obvious but no less true is the fact that those same body minds are in many ways shaped in the first place and throughout our lives by factors external to us. Although modern medicines focus on the individual organism and its internal processes isn't run as such, it misses something vital. The pivotal influence of the mental, emotional, social and natural environments in which we live. Our biology itself is interpersonal. End of quote. In the neurodiversity debate, a, a dichotomy is formed, dividing the world into separate organisms of neurotypical people and neurodivergent people. Uh, but that's a dichotomy altogether. The truth is, there is no neurotypical or normal person. Every person is a unique combination of genes and brain cells interconnected, interrelated with other people and the environment, all acting as one whole organism. Since other people are part of the environment and genes are part of those other people, our genes are interacting receiving environmental signals from other people's genes. So we've got genes interacting with the genes of other people, and that just may be how the mutations in, say, people who are autistic, are interacting with other people around us in the population, which enhances the adaptability of our population, enabling those who don't have the mutation the ability in order to adapt. So, as Evelyn Fox Keller said, all these various genes in variable environments may actually be the next step in evolution. Please, in the comments section, please may you share your thoughts with me. Do you think neurodiversity, the genes associated with the disabilities, uh, are they the next step in evolution? Uh, or share any other thoughts with me which you may be interested in. If you made it this far, thank you for listening. And, and it would be appreciated if you would hit like, hit subscribe, so that more people can become aware. Thank you.